So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Everyone knows that we run right on time, but this is just another reason why we need high speed internet in some of the counties that we're gonna have a pleasure to talk to. We have Pennsylvania Senator Camera Bartolotta and she is from the 46th district. But before I bring her on, let me just give you a couple of things. First of all, we have Jonathan Kirsting here with us today. He's vice president of all things media and marketing. He's gonna manage the questions. And I wanna give a shout out to our sponsors, Huntington Bank, AT&T and 40 by 80, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Pittsburgh Tech Council working on workforce development. But our partners, Huntington Bank and AT&T are heavily involved with us in all things related to a lot of matters. And today is no different. We're very thrilled to have Senator on and uh, she will probably crack some really important policy jokes about the importance of high-speed internet and uh, in the counties that she represents and beyond. But I'm going to bring her up to the front. Um, this is not a chance for you to sell your wares. This is all about the senator today. This is all about her. So thank you all for joining. So thank you, Senator. Thank you so much for being here. And I know that you had some trickiness in, in signing on this morning and you made some yes, uh, funny-isms about it, <laughs> which I think is pretty timely. But before we talk policy, let's just take a few minutes to talk, to talk about your background and talk about your district. You have been in the General Assembly since 2014, but before that you were a small business owner. And I would like you to talk about how you went from your roots in entrepreneurship and small business to the Pennsylvania Senate. Okay, well, I, uh, my, my late husband and I opened up the very first drive-through quick lube in the Mon Valley in 1988. And until just uh, the beginning of 2020, I was working in that business. And in the first six and a half years that we had that location, I was literally there every hour that it was open. Every entrepreneur, business owner gets it. You live there, you eat, breathe and sleep your business to try to grow it. So here I am, this uh, 23 year old who just moved to Southwestern Pennsylvania from Los Angeles and left a, a pretty interesting acting career to come to Monongahela, Pennsylvania and drop tranny pans and flush barristeria fluid. So that was interesting. Yeah, how did that happen? <laughs> okay. um, I met my late husband, Bruce Bartolotta, out in Southern California. He was a lawyer and he was doing a, uh, a record deal for a cousin of his who actually is from the Pittsburgh area and was living out there trying to, you know, break into the biz. And uh, apparently I'd, I'd done a lot of television shows with Ernie Pontier, his, my late husband's cousin, didn't remember that. But anyway, um, so it was a blind, blind date. And, you know, do you want to go out? I'm like, oh, my God, what? Who is this person? But uh, being a typical southwestern Pennsylvania boy, Bruce was the most authentic, genuine, real person I'd ever met in my life. And that's what you get from southwestern PA. Wow. And uh, it just it just was like night and day compared to the the life that I was living um, in Hollywood. So uh, anyway, the um, uh, we started the business in '88, and uh, for six and a half years I lived there constantly, doing everything every hour of the day. And I never would ask one of my employees to do something I hadn't done. So uh, I would you know change an oil and change in tranny paint fluid and all kinds of stuff. So that was, that was surprising until I, um, my second child was born, um, who is my son. My daughter came first. My son, who I think is half Reese's monkey, because uh, he, he loved to climb on everything and out of everything. So it's like, okay, I cannot be in a facility with open pits <laughs> and uh, a child who is Houdini. Uh, so I, I spent the, the following years running it from home and being there as often as I could and all that. But everybody understands, you know, you do everything that is required of every employee you have. Um, the best compliment I got was a couple of different phone calls during the first 10, 15 years or so where I would train our new employees coming in. And the first week was what you do under the car and under the hood. And then the second week was, let's, let me show you how to scrub a toilet. So I got a couple of phone calls from moms that said, thank you so much for teaching my son how to clean a bathroom. <laughs> okay. So little things like that. 
you never think that those were going to be a highlight of the day. So uh, moving to southwestern Pennsylvania, like I said, and um, working really hard and raising a couple of kids and realizing the difference in the culture and the values and the magic of southwestern Pennsylvania that I had never been exposed to before that, you know, neighbors say, how you doing? And they wait for an answer. <laughs> you know, if, if you need directions, somebody will say, oh, here, I'll take you or follow me or just the incredible generosity and just a hometown nice feel. Um, no better place to raise your kids than Southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, but I saw a lot of that disappearing over the years. As again, I was here in, in 88, but then over the years, you start seeing a lot of these industries closing down, a lot of these young families having to move out of Pennsylvania to find a decent family sustaining job. And I thought, I kept saying, isn't anybody going to do something about this? And then finally it was okay. Well, as I've always taught my kids, if you're not going to be part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I was yeah. recruited into politics. Never thought I was ever, ever going to do that. I'd helped some campaigns here and there, but uh, uh, in, in 60 seconds or less, um, what really sparked the whole thing for me to run for office was when, again, I was asked to run for house and uh, petitions were going out already. It was like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You know, my husband had just passed 18 months prior. My son was still in high school. I'm running a business. I'm handling family and all these other things. And I said, you guys are nuts. I said, no. So they came back a couple of months later and asked if I would run for state Senate. They said, you have two years until that race. I said, fine. I immersed myself in every council meeting, borough, township, everything I could do, called everyone I knew, talked to everyone I knew about this. Because as women in politics will tell you, we think we have to have a PhD in whatever before we jump in. Um, you know, oftentimes you'll ask a guy if, you know, they'll, they'll want to run, oh, sure, yeah, I can be governor, let's go. Um, so it, there's a little bit of a difference there. We just want to know everything and, and be an expert. So I said, give me six months, and then I'll, I'll tell you if I think I can do a good job, I will, I'll, I'll run. But if I don't, I'll help anybody who can. In that six months time, my daughter came home from Ohio University on spring break, sure her freshman year. And she said, hey, mom, I've got a couple of my sorority sisters going on uh, mission trips for spring break. I thought that is so wonderful. God bless them. I have friends who've been to Cuba or Jamaica. And she says, no, Manesson. Manesson is the town across the, the river from my house. And at the time, it was part of the 46th senatorial district. And with, you know, that year it got redistricted out. I said, okay, I'm in. This is ridiculous. Let's do it. So uh, that was my very first phone call. My first official phone call was to the mayor of Manesson. Even though it wasn't the district anymore, I said, this is how I got involved. This is why I'm here. And what's good for you is good for me. We're all part of the Mon Valley. Let's work together. So wow. that's how I got started. So your district, what does it include now? Talk about the district itself. Um, it includes all of Greene County, okay. almost all of Washington County, except for Peters Township, one municipality that's not involved in, okay. in the district. And then six municipalities up in Beaver County. So I've got Aliquippa, um, Hopewell, Hanover, uh, um, Independence, uh, South Heights, and okay. Anyway, there's six municipalities. I got, I do them in alphabetical order and I threw one in there um, uh, out of order. So I got stuck, but from Aliquippa to the arms of West Virginia, the whole corner of the Keystone State is district 46. How would you describe the district then? What's like your overview, some of the unique challenges? Well, a lot of the unique challenges are just topography for one. Now, you know, we've got loads of mountains and valleys and things like that. So that is prohibitive for a lot of broadband to be set up easily and efficiently and economically. So we're working on a lot of different issues down there when it comes to literally getting schools and and folks who are having to work remotely. Um, good luck to a lot of those folks who live in Greene County and southwestern Washington County. It, broadband is extremely sparse in those areas and we're doing all kinds of things to, to alleviate that. We just got some grants 
and um, through my office, and we have provided funding for a couple of, of like 5G receivers down in the Greene County area, mm -hmm. uh, you know, three of them as a matter of fact, so that will really help the West Green School District and all of those businesses and parents in that area get online. But again, geology is a big challenge because when it comes to slips and slides for our roads, our bridges and things, it's just nonstop because of the geology in Southwestern Pennsylvania. It's different even from Northeastern Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So even PennDOT issues are a real challenge where we are when it comes to all the slips. I think we had over 800 in one year. Really? Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of things to consider. And it's, it's a lot of things are done differently in Southwestern Pennsylvania because of things like that. Wow. So let, let's talk about the state's upcoming budget, right? Um, but before we do that, can you talk, give us an update on the vaccination efforts? That has been a very big challenge for all of Pennsylvania. And to me, it should not have been. We knew months and months and months and months ago that a vaccine was going to be rolled out. So where was all of the planning? And, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, that's the federal government's fault. It's, you know, it's Trump's fault. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but Pennsylvania and Puerto Rico are the only two United States entities that did not have a comprehensive plan for rolling out the vaccine. And I think that Pennsylvania and Puerto Rico were not the only two entities that had Trump as a president. I think the whole rest of the country did. And there are so many other states who've done it so much better than we have. And my statement has been from the very beginning of this pandemic, back on in March of 2020, our the, the governor and the, the administration never brought in experts. They didn't talk to the, the leaders of the Senate, Democrat or Republican, or the House, Democrat or Republican. They didn't bring in Gene Barr, president of the Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce, or Manufacturers Association, or the Realtors Association, or the Restaurant Association. None of them were considered, and they were all clamoring to say, look, here's our plan. This is what we can do to save lives and livelihoods. That's been my motto since day one. They're not mutually exclusive. Pennsylvania suffered the most strict lockdowns of almost every other state in the country. They, they shut down all construction, all construction, at, and no other state had. Real estate sales, well, where are people supposed to move to if they've already sold one home and they're looking for, it left so many people in limbo and then shutting down industries for as long as they were uh, you know, th there are ways to do things to protect people's health, mm -hmm. but not destroy everyone's lifelong investments. I mean, the suicide rates have skyrocketed. The overdose rates have skyrocketed. Depression and poverty. Uh, it, a, a lot of these things would have been avoided with just proper communication and collaboration and transparency. So working with local governments. So what do you think about now? I mean, so here we are, vaccines are available. I mean, yeah. I don't know if there's enough of them, but vaccines are available. What do you, where do you think we are now? We're, we're 42nd in the country for uh, getting vaccines in arms. Well, do you think that anything's gonna change over the next few weeks? Well, my, my hope is, um, and what I'm hearing, is that there are many counties taking things into their own hands, yeah. saying, look, we've waited long enough for the administration to roll out some sort of a plan. And there really isn't one. I think they were on the fourth or fifth iteration of some kind of something. Um, you know, the, and I want to assure people, our hospitals are not hoarding the vaccine. They're distributing them as quickly as they come in, but they're not even made aware sometimes three, four, five days, if they're lucky, a week beforehand that they're getting vaccines and what, how many they're getting. So it's become very challenging for our healthcare systems to 
establish any kind of appointment schedule and any of those things. Um, I heard, and I wish I remembered what state it was in, maybe you can help me with this, but most recently there was a, a state that was uh, in one particular area, they were having people wait two hours in line to get their vaccines. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They went to Chick-fil-A. Yeah, I saw that. Management of Chick-fil-A and they said, oh, okay, well, we'll set it up this way, down to 15 minutes. You know what? Find people who are doing it right and get their advice. So do you have hope for us for the next few weeks? You know what? I, I absolutely do, because I do know that, again, there are a lot of counties out there. There are only 10 counties in Pennsylvania out of 67 counties that have their own Department of Health. And they sort of have their own way of doing things. And they're, you know, up and running to, with their own system, pretty much. But the, the 57 other counties were waiting on advice or guidance or something and just haven't really been getting it. So I know at least here in Washington County, uh, one of the counties I represent, the county commissioners, they bought two big sub-zero freezers and they applied and are now going to be a distribution site. So, you know, and I also have been talking with a good friend of mine. Um, actually, he learned how to fly on my airplane, uh, but he is now working with a company called Curative. And what they do is they go state to state to state. Have you heard about them, Audrey? Okay, phenomenal. And Great. they do all the logistics. They, they train people and with 40 people, they can open up, you know, a closed Macy's or a JCPenney's, anywhere that they can get a large area to bring people in from out of the cold and cue them, you know, so that they're socially distant, they can set it up and they can dole out vaccinations at about a thousand a day. And with a little bit of a ramp up, they can do up to 5,000 in a day. When we get to the point where we're vaccinating the largest group of individuals. And again, to that point exactly, when we started this, the 1A phase in Pennsylvania with healthcare workers and those you know, hands-on with, with folks, um, there was about one and a half million folks on that list. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden it was like, oh, wait a minute, we're gonna add all this whole other group into 1A also. That added 2.5 million people to that list. So listen, your entrepreneurial roots, you know, that you have to be chomping at the bit because oh you're God. an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. You just get it done, right? Like <laughs> Jonathan smiling. Yeah. Uh -huh. You got it. On our team is like, hey, let's just buy a let's just buy a freezer. Let's just do it. Right. Yeah. Well, but again, it's it's like you're you're looking at these people in your community desperate for some sort of help desperate for anything and people are going and they're lining up two hours ahead of time in the cold elderly people with delicate conditions are lining up when all they need is just somebody with leadership skills and the ability to take control and say okay this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it and you're going to get an appointment here and you're going to get an appointment there stay in your car until this time come on in we'll take care of you but we're um, still having people who can't get appointments. So right, it, right, it is is just all over the place. Exactly. So, uh, before we get to a question, I want to I want to ask you something here. You um, a couple of things. Go Lieutenant Governor Fetterman on we had him on the program and we keep up with him and he talked about a few issues, including his hopes to legalize marijuana. Mm -hmm. You've been a broad champion for criminal justice reform. Can you talk about those efforts and does the Lieutenant Governor actually have a point relative to decriminalization of marijuana uh, related offenses? Well, I actually have a bill that I've, I've worked on with Senator Sharif Street and mm -hmm. it is to decriminalize marijuana. I'm not at the point right now for legalizing recreational because when we passed uh, legalizing um, medicinal cannabis, back in 2016, the point was, okay, now we're going to use the great minds of Pennsylvania and we're gonna do research and development. We're gonna follow the lead of Israel who's been using medicinal cannabis for a laundry list of diseases and all sorts of health issues with great success. And for 50 years, they've been doing that. Uh, let's take that lead and let us use this resource that is cheap, that is prevalent, that you know, has been around for a really long time and find all of these ways that we can benefit the health 
of our, our citizens in Pennsylvania. Money wasn't going into research and development the way it should have been. People were getting mm -hmm. licenses that shouldn't have been getting them. You know, we were told it wasn't a political thing, but mm, anyway, uh, you know, I know from a lot of different research, one, one of my studies in college was psychology and we studied the brain development from in utero to geriatric, the whole thing and brain synapses and the effects of THC and all that. At least that wasn't my dog. I just heard that. <laughs> I kept mine out. Mine had a little bit of a fight the other day and I'm like, what is that? Anyhow, <laughs> the choice of Zoom, I love it. I love it. Um, but uh, I think we need to focus on research and development and the true benefits of medicinal cannabis before we unleash recreational. Because you know what happens then? We're done with the research for medicinal. And that would really be tragic for a lot of these these parents of kids with Dravet syndrome and even Parkinson's and all these other possibilities for it. I would much rather see it focused on that. And, and secondly, um, I'm all about workforce development. I'm all about re-entry for right. those coming out of incarceration. You open up recreational marijuana and, you know, as business owners that are watching, you know, now or in the future, you want someone who can pass a drug test. Mm -hmm. It's pretty difficult right now to have people, to have enough people in the workforce who can pass a drug test. And you open up that door and I just think it's gonna do a big disservice to a lot of our entrepreneurs, our business leaders who are looking to hire and train people who, who wouldn't be able to because they, they wouldn't be able to pass a drug test. So well, that's my concern. Thing, one of the things, I mean, you're making a lot of good points. One of the things is that our neighbors at, at all around us are legalizing it. So. There's yeah, exactly. Opportunity for revenue. Well, but the thing is, too, to to uh, you know, let's let's not have Pennsylvania put more people behind bars for doing something that they can do legally in other states. I'm all for that. That's fine. And we have far too many people behind bars for technical violations already. That's another bill that I have: probation reform. Stop putting people behind bars for a technical violation of probation. And there's the majority of people in county lockup are there for a technical violation. So an example and of a technical violation. A technical, if you're on probation and you're at a half way house and you have a, I don't know, a six pack of beer under your bed and they find it, you go back to jail. Wow. A mom who's working three jobs and three years into her probation, and, you know, finds out her, her, her manager says, no, 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 you can't leave at 10 o'clock tonight. I'm keeping you till midnight. Well, I'm supposed to call my probation officer. I'm supposed to check in or whatever. Hey, sorry, you know, you're fired if you leave. Okay, well, if she doesn't make that phone call, she could go back behind bars for violating probation. There's a long list of, of requirements when you're on probation and parole. And if you violate those, they can put you back in jail. Mm -hmm. And that's not keeping our streets safer. That's not keeping families uh, together. That's not keeping people employed. I just had lunch with a person three days ago who was on probation and was riding with a friend. He wasn't even driving. And the friend experienced this issue of road rage, okay? And it wasn't even him who was doing it. This other gentleman chased, that didn't like being cut off, chased these two guys into a parking lot, pinned them in and pulled the gun on them and called the police. But because he was on probation and had any kind of interaction with law enforcement, and couldn't afford bail, they put him in jail for a month and a half because he just happened to be there. He lost his job. So, I mean, these are things that we have to look at. I'm all for making our streets safer, but not for wasting taxpayer dollars on things like that. Jonathan, I'm gonna go on mute for a second. Pull out a couple of good questions. There's some, there's some good questions. There's statements, but there's some good questions in there. Senator, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. So a question from Zach wants to know, um, having grown up in the Mon Valley and moved away from the area due to local economics uh, situations, um, what are you doing to keep your word and to give back to that community that inspired you to get into politics? Oh, I love that question. That's fantastic. Um, I am continually looking for ways and finding ways actually to infuse the Mon Valley with 
um, business opportunities, with employment opportunities, with grants for re-educating, for workforce development, for all sorts of things. I'm also on the LSA board. Some people know what that is, the local share account, which is casino money. Every year there's a pot, a small pot of money that gets um, uh, put into this local share account. And on the board, we see applicants for uses for that funding. Um, the majority of it are for nonprofits or historical sites, or but a lot of them too are for economic development. So those are things that I'm very passionate about. Let's get people back to work. Let's make our communities welcoming to businesses so that people want to build a home here. They want to raise their family here and go to school here, all of those things. Um, I'm very passionate about our local school districts and making sure that they are doing the absolute best that they can. Um, I've, I've worked very hard to uh, support the, uh, uh, the fair funding formula for education dollars moving forward so that, you know, just because you're in a rural area doesn't mean that your kids that grow up here deserve a, a, a mediocre education. Mm -hmm. Not that that's what they're getting, but you know what, they can't afford iPads or, or you know, uh, Chromebooks and things to go home with. And, you know, through through uh, my wonderful district director, Renick Ramley, who's I think listening somehow on here, um, be, because there's one school in my district that is in a very impoverished area. They didn't have enough money to buy computers for their students to take part in, and this was before COVID, to be um, able to do their own version of uh, cyber school. So they were losing all of these students to a different cyber school. And mind you, that school district still has to pay for them. That money comes out of that school district. And unfortunately, many times when a child leaves a school district and goes to cyber, they're automatically put into an IEP. They're mm -hmm. automatically considered, you know, uh, special needs. So that costs triples out of the school district. So through Renick's help and connections, he knows we were able to get 40 computers for that school district. Good. All those students were able then to do their own cyber school. It saved the school over $200,000 a year. Little things like that. And it was a donation. It was a donation. So we, we do all we can to try to think outside the box to make sure that we're doing everything we can to bring jobs, good paying jobs and industry and manufacturing into the Mon Valley. Hope that you, your questions are actually involved, you were actually involved, Senator, with um, the film industry and the film tax credit. We just had Don Kieser on, I think it was Friday. We Thursday, she told me. <laughs> yeah, so, I love that. Yeah. So tell us what your role is and any thoughts about that. Well, I started the first ever film industry caucus. And there are so many people who are very much involved in it, really want to participate in it. And having grown up in Los Angeles and been in the film industry for so long, I know how beneficial the film industry can be to a region. The uh, return on that investment is incredible. Mm -hmm. So I have legislation out right now. We don't even have a bill number on it because I'm circulating it right now to get co-sponsorships and interest from other senators. But it is to, uh, we have to rebrand uh, the film industry. Well, it's, it's a tax credit is what they're calling it right now. So it's called the, to film the film tax credit in Pennsylvania. And it, that's absolutely wrong. It's the wrong thing to call it because the independent fiscal office, the IFO in Pennsylvania was asked to, to they answered the, 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 the right answer to the wrong question. How much tax money is the film industry bringing back to Pennsylvania? You can't ask it that way. That's not, that's not the way to do it. You're looking at a pile of money through a keyhole and you're seeing 20 bucks. No, there's a room full. This means thousands of good jobs. This means tourism dollars. This means how many people still go to Philly and climb the Rocky Steps? What was that 40 years ago? <laughs> there are so many places like that right now. And, you know, uh, the Joker was filmed here and it, it's just astounding the ripple effect economically for any community that has the film industry come into it. And there is no more mo mobile industry than the film industry. 
Mm -hmm. So my legislation would change the verbiage and rebrand it to the film industry incentive and raise the cap right now. I mean, Dawn and I struggled like mad people two years ago to get it raised to 70 million. Mm -hmm. But if we could at least get it up to 125 million, uh, that would that would catch all of these, you know, these Netflix and Hulu and and, you know, Amazon Prime, all of these entities that are trying desperately to produce content and they want to do it in Pennsylvania and we just need to open the door and they'll be here. Well, uh, here's the last thing because I know we started a few minutes late, but I want to get this point in because I really care about your opinion here. So like most state governments, right, Pennsylvania is uh, facing a substantial, as I mentioned earlier about the marijuana budget shortfall. Mm -hmm. How critical is it for Congress to provide some relief to the state government? And then related, we saw the governor proposed nearly 50% increase in personal income tax rate, which as you can hear by my voice, I'm not you know, excited about at all. Mm -hmm. This is that most small businesses would be taxed in Pennsylvania. So here we are, people who are living in the city, just as I am, we probably live in the antithesis of an environment, but I live in, in, in the city proper and we would pay now a combined 7.5%. So let's put that in context with who we're competing with, Austin and Miami, zero, zero personal income tax rates with aggressive recruitment, aggressive recruitment. So with Congress set to act in the states like Florida and Texas, they're cleaning our clocks. They really are. And, and what do we do? Is the governor's tax proposal really warranted? No. No, and, and uh, you know, one of the other, my degrees in business, and I can't imagine anyone who's ever even had Economics 101 thinking that that budget is going to be helpful in any way. The only thing it's going to do is chase more capital investment out of Pennsylvania and taxing our, our mom and pops, our small businesses to the tune of 46%. It's a 46% increase on their personal income tax. Every single small business pays personal income tax on their business. And a lot of that isn't even on their, on their balance. I mean, you don't even take that home. I know from 31 years of experience, right. okay? Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's a non-starter because we have literally seen our mom and pops, our small businesses in Pennsylvania beaten like a pinata mm -hmm. for a year, almost a year, closing down everything. Right. They, they're existing just, we'll, we'll never see thousands of them open their doors again. Thousands of businesses are done for good. Mm -hmm. And then for those that are left to throw them an anvil and call it a life preserver, that's ludicrous. So to me, that is an absolute non-starter. If you want more money in the coffers of Pennsylvania by tax revenue, let's invite people in. Let's stop being so unfriendly to business. There is no predictability in Pennsylvania when it comes to anything, when it comes to taxation, regulation, zoning, permitting. Oh my God. Uh, it, it, there's no predictability whatsoever. So we have literally shut our doors on billions of dollars in capital investment that has gone elsewhere. And we just keep doing it. Those are thousands and thousands of good paying jobs that would what? Pay taxes, bring them in, be welcoming. Stop trying to tax the crap out of everyone and every industry and, and shutting your doors on what could be beneficial to the bottom line in Pennsylvania. Listen, we're gonna count on you to move this agenda forward, okay? Yep. I, we've made a lot of comments today. I know that we started late. I apologize for that. Stay here. No, I'm just trying to be sensitive to everyone's time. We care about you. Have we put, a, we care about supporting you and making sure that this agenda gets, you know, articulated and raised because it, the magic that you conveyed earlier about living here, I mean, yeah. coming from the West Coast and being in, you know, in film and being around that sort of you know, cadre of, of people, you get it, you totally get it. So first of all, my hat's off to you for having the passion and being someone who is a small business owner 
and driving the agenda forward. If anyone wants to reach out to you, there should be a link that we put out there. Um, I am sure that you will listen to people whether or not they're inside your area or not. We always do, we always do. And it's easy. I'm the only state Senator named Camera. Pretty easy to find. We really love that name, we love that name. So I, so everyone reach out to Senator. She, what you see here is what you get. And I really appreciate that. We're gonna continue to, to figure out ways to make sure that this is an amazing place for people to live and work, but we have to be competitive. We have to be. Mm -hmm. We didn't even get into the severance tax or the race horse development fund or any of the other whack-a-moles right. that the governor's trying to do. So next time. Well, we're gonna have to have you back. We're gonna have to have you back. We'll stay connected. There were lots of comments out here. We'll capture them and right. uh, share them with your team. And I wanna thank everyone for your patience, for being with us today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your passion and joining us today. So thanks th everyone so much. Keep doing what you're doing. Well, who thank are we you. having tomorrow? Who do we have tomorrow? We have Jennifer Coyne stopping by. She leads up additive manufacturing at WabTech, talking about that in Neighborhood 91. Her resume is impressive. Cannot wait to talk with her tomorrow. That's great. All right, well, thank you everyone. Sorry that we, uh, Started late, but as you can see, it was well worth waiting. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, everyone.